In the Tools menu, the section called Global Product Options is kind of important. <clears throat> I'm curious, for those of you who got the Windows bundle for the seminar today, do you see these same windows down here for memory usage where you can specify a number or does it just say medium, high, low? Okay, that's because the training bundle that we shipped out is based on the 32-bit version of the software. We have both the 32 and 64-bit version. 64 gives you more flexibility in specifying things like memory cache limits. If you are on a computer with a lot of RAM available, there's some optimization that can come from increasing these limits. I usually don't like to get them too big. I find that there's sort of a balance point with um, being able to maintain good multitasking while also um, having enough RAM available to be useful. Now, this top one, default genome map, is an important one to be aware of. And if you are working mostly with human data, probably odds are that the default setting for GRCH37 is correct. If, do we have anyone working with model organisms or non-human? I know, Robin, you said you're working with mice and rats. OK. Um, I believe you'll find mice and rat genomes are available in here. Yeah, there's Rattus norvegicus, however you say that. I'm not very good at Latin. So there's two different versions of the rat genome that we currently are supporting. Although if you are using a genome that you don't see in this list, just let us know. We can add it in. The important part about the genome map selection is that is what's used when you start drawing any plots in genomic space. It needs to know how many chromosomes there are, how long each chromosome is, and just be able to use that data to create your visualizations in the proper context. And there's honestly not a lot else that that genome map is used for. It does also determine which annotation tracks are visible to you by default. Um, in the data sets we're looking at today, one of them will actually be based on um, GRCH, or sorry, NCBI 36, so the older human build. That's what we'll be working with in our first demo data set, and then with the second one, we'll be in the newer GRCH 37. Okay? And um, you can also change the genome build at a per project level, but whatever species you're working with the most and whatever genome build you're working with the most is usually helpful to set as your default genome map. And other options here, I'll point out that if you are working in a lab where there are a number of people all using the software and you want to share a single database for annotations or for collecting any custom scripts you might write, you can change the default location where annotations are saved and where other bits of data are saved. 90% of the time, um, you'll just want to leave these exactly how they are if you're working alone or um, with limited interaction or collaboration with others. Okay. So we'll cancel out of here. Now, you should have a data set. I'm not sure if it works the same on all of the training bundles, but do you see an item right here in this list that has a name similar to this one, SVS SNP GWAS training? Go ahead and click that. And when you click it, you should see a project navigator screen very similar to what I have here, although I don't think you have this last node. So I'm just going to delete that so we're all looking at the same thing. Okay, you've got the... Okay. So yours is not showing up here. Click on open existing project. And then, oops. Yeah, hopefully we don't have too many difficulties there. We might just have to ask you to kindly follow along. If you can find where the bundle was installed, it's on your desktop or somewhere else, it's easy to navigate to it. And 
What we're going to do is follow along roughly according to this document. We may skip a few steps and um, add in a few others as we go along. But right now, and unfortunately we forgot to put page numbers on this, we are somewhere on this uh, part 1B opening project. And so when you open the project, you should see a screen that looks something like this, where there are four visible nodes. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but you can see that when a data set is first imported, it appears as a top level node in what we call the project navigator. And each function that we run will produce some kind of an output that will appear as a child node. And notice if you click on this first one, or double click on it, sorry, you should open up a spreadsheet that looks like this. Or, um, you can just kind of wave at me when you successfully open the spreadsheet so I know you're all keeping up. Okay, so we've got a few of you there. Um, now, what I want to focus on right now is how you would go about editing any data. So, we mentioned this this morning, but of course, all of your, um, not all, sorry, I'm having a hard time collecting my thoughts here. I've been on my feet for a long time today. So if you ever need to make any changes to a data set, the way to do that is under the edit menu. You see this item called edit this spreadsheet. There's also a keyboard shortcut, control E, that takes you straight into the editor mode. I tend to use the keyboard shortcuts a lot. But in the editor mode, there are a number of different things you can do. If you simply pick a cell and click on it and change the value, you can. You'll notice that the value that you've changed um, is highlighted in red. We keep track of all of your changes. Nothing is permanent until you click the Save button. Then also, there are some different automatic types of things you can do. If you come up right to the top of column one, where it says phenotype one, and right mouse click, and on Macs, I can never remember what the right click thing is. Control click, okay. Now also on Mac, something I'll point out, if you just normal click right on the number, so the column number instead of the column name, you get the same action as if you right click. So by clicking on the column number, you see, for example, this option down here to convert to binary. This is the one I used earlier today. If you ever need to convert between different data types, and just to back up a little bit, you see this blue letter C? That indicates that the software recognizes it as a categorical variable. R means it recognizes it as a real number numeric value or a floating point value if you're a computer programmer. Uh, the letter B indicates binary, I, integer, and there's also G, which is genotypic, is the last column type. And it's important when you enter a new data set that those columns all are formatted with the expected data type because they're all handled differently in analysis, and they all have different options associated with them. So if, for example, when you import your data, um, you have some random cell in this numeric column that has a bit of text in it, or maybe it has a um, an unusual character, a dollar sign or a percent sign or something, that might force the entire column into a categorical type, which is how we classify any text strings. So if you need to fix that, you would come here to the editor, fix that particular cell, and then you could come in and convert it into 
a numeric data type. Since it's already a real number value, there's no option to convert to reals. But as long as there's no data that um, directly prevents it from being converted to a number, it will do it here. But what we need to do so that we can continue with the tutorial is convert the schema type 1 into a binary variable. And that's because in SVS, when we're doing association tests, the dependent variable that we use to specify phenotype has to be a number, either a binary 0, 1 flag or um, an integer or a real number type. We can't support uh, case control testing when you just have the words case and control. So if we come to this convert to option and select binary, you get the choice, you know, which of the categories do you want to be converted to ones? If we had a more complicated variable where there were three or four or five or 200 different levels, we could go through and pick everything we wanted to be converted to ones, the rest would be turned into zeros. In this case, just select cases to be one and click OK. And I think in the tutorial it might be written slightly different. It says to use the option to create a new column instead of just replacing the values. Um, we'll deal with that as we go along. So once you have made all of the changes you want to make, you can click this little blue Save button, also in the File menu, Save. And you see this choice to create the new edited spreadsheet either as a group level node, and I'll show you what that means in a minute, or as a child of the current spreadsheet. Just keep it under the current spreadsheet and click OK. So if we look now at the project navigator, you can see that it created this new spreadsheet as a child node. So this is what we were choosing, whether it was directly associated with the source data from the edit where we started at, or whether it was saved down here as a top level, which would have been a new spreadsheet altogether. Is everyone following me? OK. So I think we finished part two on data editing and manipulation. Let's go to part three, sample QA basics. And here we're just going to demonstrate a few QA functions and a few plotting functions that we haven't seen yet today. And the first thing we're going to do is look at sample call rates, so part 3A. And before we do that, I'm trying to remember, were we supposed to merge data yet? No, we didn't merge anything. So, Open up this spreadsheet that's called 500K Genome Training Data. Now, since most of you will have the 32-bit version, you might find some things you're doing are going to run a little bit slower than what they're doing on my computer. Uh, I apologize for that. But we um, decided to share the 32-bit version in case anybody only had access to 32. So, sorry Josh, is that you? Okay. What we want to do now is calculate some sample level statistics. So earlier this morning I showed you how you could get genotype level stats. We looked at call rates and allele frequencies and such. But what if you want to have a sample wise call rate? If you look in the quality assurance menu, there's a whole list of different things that can be done here. But what we want to focus on is this submenu called genotype. And specifically, this very first option, or actually the third option, genotype statistics by sample. In this menu, we have a lot of choices available. And some of them are specific to sequencing data. Some are more specific to this type of GWAS data. So you kind of need to pick and choose a little bit on which options you want to keep. You'll notice this help button. In pretty much every function in the software, you'll find this help button that when you click it, it will take you straight into our manual where you can read more about that particular menu and 
exactly what all of the different options in there mean and what they will give you. But here, what we want to do right now is we'll just go ahead and run this. Um, let's turn on gender inference and X statistics. And I'm actually going to increase this threshold for male-female separation up to 5%. And we'll just run it from there. By default, you see it always will generate call rates and heterozygosity. And that heterozygosity will be split out by both autosomal and overall heterozygosity. Go ahead and run this. And it should go relatively quickly. Now, just in case you didn't follow, again, we just checked this one box for gender inference, and we increased the threshold up a little bit, 5%, because I know this particular data set has some noise in males where there's um, some of them have a 2 or 3% heterozygosity rate on the X chromosome. So questions while we're waiting for this to run? Is everybody keeping up? Okay. Josh is up there on the back row. He'll watch all of your screens for me. If he sees anybody surfing the web, he'll, he'll lay the smack down. All right, so mine's just about done. How are yours doing? Are you close to finishing? How's the progress bar? 65? Yeah? OK. So that's the probably the 32-bit effect. It's kind of fun to do these sessions sometimes because you can look around the room and figure out exactly who has the high performance computers and who doesn't. Um, but honestly, there's a lot of different factors that affect performance. People ask us about hardware specs all the time and what you need. It really varies from one function to the next. Some are limited by RAM availability. Some are limited more by read-write speed on your hard drive. And in general, most functionality can run on commodity desktop hardware or laptops like we all have in the room today. There are a few things, especially on data import, that we haven't talked about much yet where uh, it helps to have a little bit heavier duty computers. OK, so is everyone done now? Okay, you should have an output spreadsheet that looks similar to this. And let's talk about what we've got here. So column number one is the total number of called genotypes. Two is the call rate. Let's take a closer look at call rate. Um, if you right click on this column, it is a numeric column. It has the R at the top. And in numeric columns, we get a lot of functions that are available to us that are specific to numbers including the ability to sort. So if you click that sort button, you'll see that we have sample call rates down to about 90%. Sort the other way, descending, and see that the highest is at about uh, 98%. Now if we scroll across, I believe we also have, further over, a call rate that's exclusive to the autosomes. That's going to be important if you have X and Y chromosome data. This project has just X data. We would expect that males and females would both have calls on X, but Y is only going to be called in males. And I've seen situations where you get a bimodal distribution on call rate, and it's perfectly correlated with gender, and it's because you've got the whole genome data, including Y in your call rates. Now, let's come back here to this first column or sorry, second column, and click the unsort button. That's up here at the top left. And so that unsorts the data, although it's, it's not necessary to do that. I just wanted to show you it's there. And so it reverts to the original sort order. If you right click on this column again, you see this option about 2 thirds of the way down to plot histogram. We did not see a histogram this morning. So this is uh, the SVS plot viewer that should pop up on your screen where you should see this distribution of call rates. And we can tell that the minimum is right around 90%. It grows pretty well. And then there's a drop off up here at the high end. If you want to add more granularity to your histogram, 
you can come over here to the graph controls. And notice that when I click here on user graphs at the top level, I get really the only option available is to add some notes to it or to um, add another item into the plot. If I click on graph one, then I get controls that are specific to how this is being drawn, including the ability to increase the bin count. So if I want to click this up higher and see more what the shape of this distribution is, I can. Um, also, I can control some other things like whether or not the title is shown and the title is whatever you change it to. We don't need to follow along with what I'm doing here. Just to point out, you can change the name. You can also change the, the legend item. So you can see how it updated that over here. Then also, you can change axis labels. And <clears throat> if you want to add another histogram inside this same window, and again, you don't need to do this, but if, for example, I wanted to put in the heterozygosity rate right on top of it as a second plot item, it will draw that in. Now, since it's distributed much lower, it gets put down at the bottom end, but you can see I now have two histograms in the same window. The next thing I can do here is if I want to get it out of that window, I can duplicate, whoops, this is what I want to do. I can actually drag it up here to user graphs. This isn't working for me like I think it should. Josh, what am I doing wrong? Uh, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to um, pull this one out and make it top level, but it's, I thought I just, well, it just duplicates it inside the same window. That's okay. We'll, we'll just ignore that for now. But you, you can see that the functionality is here to do a lot of different things. Also, I could split this. So if I come into the coloring options and recolor by variable, I can say split this call rate based on heterozygosity rate, for example. So let's grab the, there's a lot of different, okay, het rate from all columns. That's the one I want to use. And so I can specify a threshold, so where the heterozygosity is, say, above or below 50%. And what I should see now, let's turn off this one and just zoom back in over here. Um, I don't know what just happened. Something, something funny is there. But you'll find that as you play around with the options, you'll be able to um, draw lots of different graph types. And there's a lot of control over how they're displayed. OK, this is what I was trying to get. But something is not showing up right. Oh, it's probably the heterozygosity um, cutoff that I used was invalid or something. But you get the idea. OK. so. Go ahead and turn the page and come over here to this genotype gender check. Now, we already um, ran this. This particular document was written before the current sample statistics dialog was created. It used to be that the genotype gender check was a separate function. But since we have this statistics by sample that we output, so I'm just going back to that original output spreadsheet. Out here at the far, far right, <coughs> we have this um, couple different columns that are interesting. But we have this heterozygosity rate that's specific to chromosome X, and this inferred gender column, which is based on whether or not the observed heterozygosity in X chromosome was above or below that threshold that we specified. Now, if I want to compare this to the original, um, the original phenotype spreadsheet to see whether or not the gender matches, what I would need to do is begin by merging this output together with that original phenotype. So this will be our first experience with merging data. Data merges are pretty easy and simple as long as you have this same 
row label column over here at the far left. So you'll notice that in all of the spreadsheets there are column headers that are um, highlighted against a gray background and then row labels also against a gray background. And as long as you have consistent labels between spreadsheets, that's what allows you to do any functions that require cross-referencing between spreadsheets. So if I want to do a merge, I would come to the File menu and choose Join or Merge Spreadsheets. Then select the sheet I want to join it with. In this case, we'll, we'll get this edited phenotype that we made. And click the OK button. And we have a few choices here. Um, the most important ones, so matching criteria, are you matching based on row labels or some other criteria? Um, I almost never use the second option. But what it would do by default is just assume that they're already in the same order or you can go in and manually click and drag to join them together. It's always easiest to just join based on row labels. And then what you do with unmatched rows. There shouldn't be any this time around, but you can either drop the ones that are not present in both sheets or you can keep them. I'll just go ahead and run this with the default options. And what we have now is a spreadsheet where the left we have all of that sample statistics output and over to the right we have the data from the phenotype spreadsheet. Now if I want to confirm the confirm the gender calls Probably the easiest way to do that is going to be to start here with column 18, which is this header zygosity rate from all columns in chromosome X. So from this column, I want to create a histogram, just like we've already done. So click Plot Histogram. And when I do that, I see this kind of expected distribution where over to the left, is where all of the males should be with a very low heterozygosity rate on chromosome X. And then to the right we have this more um, scattered distribution of the females coming in as having a lot of heterozygous genotypes on the chromosome. Now, this time I'm going to make the coloring work right. I don't know what went wrong last time. But we're going to recolor these according to the originally stated gender from the phenotype spreadsheet. To do that, if we come right up here and click directly on the variable name, so het rate from all columns. When you click right on the variable name, that's where you get the options that control how that variable is displayed. And come into the color tab. Here you can change how it's colored and you can color it according to a second variable. So I'm going to click by variable and then select that variable and see a list of everything in the spreadsheet. Down here at the end, this last, next to the last variable called gender is the one from the phenotype spreadsheet. So if you click that and then click OK, you can see now that our, um, our histogram now has been split into two different colors. And at the moment, it's still just one plot item. I don't want to get too much into the technicalities of how this all works, but if you click the split button, it comes up as two plot items, one for males, one for females, and that is what allows us a little bit more control on how things are drawn. If I take this one for the females and just click on it once, then switch back to the item tab. Now I can adjust the opacity and I can make that yellow be more see-through. And what we can see at this point is there's a yellow group right here. So those were originally labeled as female, but they're consistent with males. And over here I can see a blue group showing through behind the yellow. So that's going to be yeah. samples that are consistent with female, but originally labeled as male. Now, you can zoom in any plot by clicking and dragging along the axis. That's what I've just done here. So I clicked there at about 30 and dragged down. And I can get 
an idea of what the actual count is. It looks like there are four samples in this zone that were mistakenly labeled female and it looks like one up here that was mistakenly labeled male. If I want to find out which ones those are, um, there's a few ways to do it, but if you come back to this spreadsheet we created, and at column 18 that has that heterozygosity rate, just sort on it, and then come over to the reported gender and sort again, You can usually figure out just by sorting this and coming right down to the breakpoint and comparing back and forth, you can see which samples are in the wrong place or in the wrong group. Um, but I'll, I'll let you all play with that on your own and see what it is. If you find, for example, um, I, I think I sorted those wrong. but. If you follow the instructions in the handout, it explains how to do it more clearly. Any questions on this? Is everyone following along? Yeah. Okay. You want to zoom back out? That's a very good question. So, when I'm in on this plot, if I wanted to zoom out, if I right-click right in the middle of the plot area, I can reset the zoom, and that goes back out all the way. There's also undo zoom, which takes you back to the most recent. Um, view level you were out and then the different multipliers. So if I zoom in on this part, you can click and drag even right inside the window to just have a box to zoom on. And I can zoom out three times or I can undo zoom, reset zoom. And that's all just by right clicking right inside of the plots. Okay. So, uh, yeah, here it is. It's all, all laid out here on the next page exactly how you would sort and filter and figure out which ones have the bad um, gender labels. You can either manually turn off those rows in your spreadsheet if you don't want to use them going forward. You can edit the spreadsheet and change them to the correct values if you're certain that nothing else was mixed up, although quite often it means that you can't trust the phenotypes for those samples at all. Okay, so let's move on over. Let's look at part C. Well, let me just ask you this. Um, this morning, for those of you who are here, I went through the process of reducing SNPs down to an informative set that we could use to run principal components analysis and use it to run IBD. Do you want to walk through how to do all of that, or should we skip ahead? It's something that takes quite a bit of time. You want to see it? Okay. All right, so we're going to be now on part C here that's called Reducing SNPs to Minimal Informative Subset. And to do this, we're going to come back to the Project Navigator. You might want to take a minute and close down some windows. And I'll point out a few things here. You can see as we've gone along, we've already created a bunch of output nodes. That's something that takes a bit of time to get used to in the software is we don't always realize how much output we're creating in an analysis project, especially if we're working in R or working um, in other programs where the output's not always right there in your face and you have to go digging to realize, oh look, I just created 15 new text files or whatever. There are some strategies you can use to avoid creating so many sheets. For example, you see right here, we have this one called Statistics by Sample plus Edited Phenotype Sheet 1. That's what we created when we did this merge between these other two sheets. That's why you see them highlighted when I click this one. It's telling me that it is linked to Sheets 101 and 104. There's 101, there's 104, and they're highlighted there. We drew a histogram based on that spreadsheet and once we did that, so that there was output associated with that spreadsheet, anything that changes either the sort order or the activation state of any columns in that spreadsheet will force the creation of a new one because this one is frozen in time the moment we run any kind of a function on it because we want to be able to repeat workflows and not have anything changed. So what happened is when we had this one open, we sorted on heterozygosity rate after making 
the histogram, and as a result, it created this second version. So it's still the same data. That's why it just calls it sheet one and sheet two. But something about a column or row has been changed and altered. So it creates something new. And if you, as you learn the software more, you'll start to realize that if you want to go back and make another plot from this data, go back to sheet one again. You can still make more plots from it, but it won't create a new node. As soon as you make a plot based on sheet two, then that one will be frozen, and the next time you want to sort it, it will create a new version. So keep that in mind. It's something we get questions about all the time, how to minimize the number of new spreadsheets being created. So um, back to our training document. Let's open up the genotype spreadsheet again. And as we follow along here, the first thing we want to do is reduce this only to be the X chromosome. Or sorry, not only the X chromosome, everything but the X chromosome. If you click this little green button right here that says map, you see all of this marker map information, including on the first row, the chromosome. We can use that to inactivate or activate particular chromosomes that we're interested in. So to, if I want to turn off X, I would come to the Select menu, and I see this option to activate by chromosomes, so very straightforward. And this opens up a selector that shows me everything present in the data. If you have sequence data where there's a lot of um, super contigs, unaligned regions where, where variants have been called, this menu might fill up the whole page because those all appear as unique chromosomes. You might have 200 different chromosomes to deal with. I'll just warn you about that. But if we want to turn off X, simply uncheck it and click OK. And you see immediately that all of those columns where I am right now on the X chromosome, they've all been grayed out. So they're inactive. They won't be used. And if I scroll back over into the autosomes, see everything remains active. Now, the next step we want to take is to apply some quality filters on the data. So in the Quality Assurance menu, under Genotype, and this should be a familiar place, we've been here a few times now. The second option in the list is Genotype Filtering by Marker. It has, whoops, has this little filter, or not filter, a little funnel next to it that's kind of the visual cue that that's the filtering tool. Now, as we come in here, um, I don't know what options you have preset there but we want to set it up to filter based on a call rate at 95%, minor allele frequency less than 5%, and down here on Fisher's exact test for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So I had the first Hardy-Weinberg test turned on. The only difference is the statistic. The first one's based on a chi-square test. But we're going to use Fisher's exact, which is what is um, in the tutorial. And it says to enter 1B minus 5. So the dialog does allow you to enter things in scientific notation, just like that. Has everybody got their values entered? So it looks kind of like mine. All right. So I'll go ahead and click Run. And it should go relatively quick. The one thing in this dialog that's going to take time is this Fisher's exact test for Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. That one is quite a bit slower than the first option, just the Fisher's test is a bit more computationally intensive. How are your progress bars doing? Keeping up? Okay. All right. So we got a finished report here, where I've got one. Everybody kind of wave at me when yours is finished. Is it getting close up there in the back? 85. 85? OK, you're doing good. You're doing good. 
So you should see a report similar to this one that's just been created called filtering results. And there are columns here for everything that we asked it to calculate. So we asked for call rate, allele frequency, and Hardy-Weinberg p-value. And there's also a column specifying which exact SNPs failed which exact parameters. And over at the far left is a flag specifying SNPs that failed for any reason. So if I want to summarize that, notice this one's a binary column, that's why it has the letter D. Oh, we just had a question pop up from external. Sorry, Josh? Oh, that's, okay, that's fine. All right, so since this is a binary column, if we right click on this one to see what our options are, one of the choices now is value counts, which will give us just a frequency summary. So if we click that, we can see 222,000 if you followed all the exact options that I selected. Should be similar. Um, 222,000 true, meaning they were removed, and 266,000 false, meaning they remain active in the data. And just like with everything else, you know, we could plot histograms if we wanted to see distributions. So you can tell that this data has a pretty low call rate. This is old AFI 500K data. It's not the greatest quality. And so putting in that frequency threshold at 95% really dropped a lot of SNPs out. Also, if we look at the allele frequency, uh, see there's a lot of SNPs that are very rare in this particular population. Probably those were SNPs that were put on the chip because they are polymorphic in other populations, whether it's African or Asian or whatever. So those have all been removed now. And when we look back at this um, genotype spreadsheet where we ran it from, we see 266,000 columns remain active. And this will be the first time we've used the subset button. But up here at the top left, you can see, really it's these two buttons right here. There's the red arrow pointing to the right, and on Mac it'll be up in your um, toolbar at the very top. And, or actually no, the shortcut buttons are by the spreadsheet. It's just the, the menu lists are up at the top in Mac. But the red arrow pointing to the right is called row subset. You can think about that as taking active rows if you have some rows on and some off. That row subset is like, grabbing the ones that are active and is pulling them out and creating a new sheet just consisting of those. The red arrow pointing down is the column subset, which is the equivalent, but it works on columns. So it takes the active columns, in this case there's 266,000 of them, and pulls them down and creates a new sheet where only those are visible. And this will go really fast. Part of why it goes so fast, if you're interested in the technical aspects, is it's not actually writing a new spreadsheet onto the disk. It's using a relational database kind of architecture in the background where it just knows that it's creating a new view of the data set only consisting of a limited number of records. So um, we now have that and we're ready to move on to the next step. Although I think we are going to rename this before we go any further. See, by default, when you create a column subset, it just labels it exactly that, column subset. But there are different ways to change the name. You can just come right here in the project and either do a slow double click on it, just like you would if you were renaming a file in Windows. You can change the name, so I'll just call it filtered data. Also, when you have the spreadsheet open, down here at the bottom you see this little tab that has the name. You can right click there and you've got the option to change it too. Either way it will be reflected back in the project navigator. Then there's also a note in the log that says you changed the name of that spreadsheet. Okay. Is everybody following along? Okay. So the next step in the process is this um, LD pruning step. 
which we did this morning. But what it will do is go through all of these SNPs and find the ones that are independent, the ones that aren't necessarily correlated with their neighbors. And this one could take a few minutes to finish. But it's in the quality assurance menu again under genotype. Um, tend to use this menu a lot in GWAS analysis. The quality control steps often take more time than the actual analysis steps, in my experience. But the one we want is right down here, about two thirds of the way down, called LD pruning. And The default options here, just to explain what it's doing, it's taking 50 SNPs at a time and checking through those 50 SNPs, looking for any pairs that are correlated with each other, and if it finds any, it will drop one out. Then it slides five SNPs to the right and does the same thing. Just to make this go a little bit faster, we're going to use a smaller window. I'm going to set it down to 30. And the window increment, I'm going to set at 15. So it'll look at a smaller window and take a bigger step. And that'll make it go quite a bit faster. And then similarly, we're going to change this LD threshold to be something a bit more restrictive. So we'll end up with a smaller set of SNPs when we're done. So 10% or 0.1, it means any SNPs that are remaining shouldn't be more than a 10% R squared um, relationship with any of the surrounding SNPs, at least within a window of 30. So has everybody got their settings all put together? Okay. And again, the settings I used there were mostly for computational efficiency to make it go a little bit faster. You may um, want to adjust in your own work if you find this particular routine valuable. LD pruning turns out to be helpful in a lot of different situations, whether it's creating a subset for running PCA or creating a rub subset for running um, IBD analysis. And you know, we even see people using it for things like developing a custom chip for particular reasons. So we have a customer who's working with chickens of all things who had a lot of sequence data for chickens. They were doing SNP discovery work and after discovering all these millions of SNPs they wanted to build a chicken GWAS array and you can use this particular function to get down to a set of tagging SNPs that will capture most of the important genomic variation. Yeah. Um, so at point 0.5, what it was doing is any, oh, actually, you're right. I think I did it backwards. Yeah, you're right. I, I, said, I said it wrong. I, I've seen a lot of different things. Um, actually, I need to look at that again because you might have just caught me on something I've been doing wrong for a long time. So LD threshold, 10%. Oh, no, so this is a maximum. So it's saying a maximum relationship of 10%. And so. Right. Yeah, now, now you're confusing me a little bit. Um, so, you know, the way to test it would be to rerun it again at 0.5 and see if we end up with more SNPs or less. <laughs> but um, so no, I'm by so I'm saying that with 10%, that means if it's at 90% very closely related, it's filtered out. If it's at 50%, it's out. If it's even at 11%, they are too closely related to each other. So anything that's left is going to be very close to zero. So they're they're not related to okay, each other. Yeah, you're right. Okay. All right. So um, for those of you that are following along, did did this finish up? Okay. Did you get a number somewhere in the neighborhood of thirty-six thousand SNPs left active? Good. 
That's what I like to hear. Um, so uh, there's some statistics and theory that will explain this, but I've found that with pretty much any GWAS array, whether it's a 500K or the modern Illumina 5M, if you follow the same basic set of steps and do a 10% LD filter, you always end up with between 30 and 40,000 SNPs left. It's kind of fun how that always works out. Okay, so I'm going to rename this one more time, and I think the tutorial tells us to call it um, filtered pruned training data. So you can call it whatever you like. I'm just going to call it filtered comma pruned. Now the next step is part four in the tutorial document. I think we're going to skip that one because it does take quite a while to compute. But um, you know, we looked at that a little bit this morning. You get output where you can see all of the pairwise relationships both in the matrix view and also in the list view. And when you're running that, you'll usually want to use this kind of a pruned subset of SNPs. Uh, looks like we've got another comment coming in here. Everything's OK. All right. But let's go ahead and turn the page and look at this next one because there's some useful new functions here that we haven't seen yet today. So part five, sample QA3, population stratification. You'll notice that in this project, you should have down at the bottom a node called 500K genotype data hat map, 500K hat map genotype data. I'm going to turn off my phone. It keeps beeping in my pocket. Now, <clears throat> what this is, I'll just open it. You don't need to necessarily look at it. But this is from HapMap phase two populations where we have 270 samples coming from European, Asian, and African cohorts. And this genotyping was done on the same AFI 500K platform. I I think the genotype calls were done with the same algorithm, too. I'm not positive, but I think these were both done with C-Realm. And what we want to do is merge these together into one big data set to run principal components analysis. But let's just focus on these same 36,000 SNPs that we've already got. The way we're going to do this is a little different from the data merges we've already done. If you come in this pruned spreadsheet under the file menu, You'll notice that in addition to the join or merge spreadsheets option, there's also one right above it called append spreadsheets. And if we are joining data in a manner where we're adding additional rows for the same set of columns, the append option is usually the way to go. So you can think of append as concatenating additional fields onto the bottom of the spreadsheet. So let's use that. So under the Sorry, in the append dialog, the first thing it asks us to do is select the spreadsheet to append with. And we'll grab this one on the bottom. It's 500K Geno half map data. So click on it. It should be highlighted. Click OK. Then it says new data set name. You can change it if you want. I'll just leave it exactly what it is, appended spreadsheet. There are some options here. Unmatched columns. Drop them or fill with missings. We want to drop them. So we'll just get those same 36,000 columns, but we'll have genotype calls from both spreadsheets. And the same option we've seen before, whether it's going to appear at the project root or under the current sheet. I'm going to put it under the current spreadsheet. And we'll let this run. This one takes a bit longer than the join or merge because this one actually is going to rewrite the data set on the disk, whereas the others are just creating a, a new view in the kind of relational sense. And so with mine, it went pretty quick. How are y'all doing? Keeping up? OK. So notice now that mine is finished. I have 835 rows instead of 565. So we've added in those additional 270 samples. If I scroll down, I can see they're all down here at the bottom. One warning I'll give you is you can't be too cavalier about joining up data sets like this. 
if you have genotyping done at different times in different places, even if it's on the same chip, one thing to really be aware of is whether or not the alleles were called on the same strand. Sometimes you'll join these together and find out that there's four different alleles for every SNP because they're all done on different strands. We do have some tricks for um, changing strand orientation and helping to match data up. We won't get into that much today, but just let you know there are utilities for doing that. But what we want to do is go ahead and run principal components analysis. And if we come in to the quality assurance menu, genotype principal component analysis, I think we're just going to go ahead and run this with all of the default settings. I, I guess the tutorial actually says to turn it down and only get the top five components. That will save us a little bit of time. So we'll go ahead and do that instead of the default 10. But we'll compute principal components and keep the default option of an additive model and normalizing based on Hardy-Weinberg. So everything should be set all right by default. Go ahead and run this. Principal components is one of the functions in the software that is multi-threaded. So if you have a dual core, quad core, eight core CPU, you'll see a big performance boost on this one. Um, I've got a quad core here, but I'm also running the webinar software and a few other things that might be slowing me down a bit. But how's progress going for you up there? Thumbs up? Okay, she's on the Mac. The Mac seems to be winning today. Um, you got the only Mac in the room? Oh, no, I'm, I'm pointing here in front of you. <laughs> All right. Um, Mac's not always faster. <laughs> in fact, it, it, I'm kind of surprised that she gave me the thumbs up there because in a lot of these demonstrations that I do, if we've got, got everybody following along, Macs tend to fall behind on certain functions. Yeah, you know, you've got the pro. Oh, no, good. <laughs> for this very reason, good. Um, also, um, the only versions of Mac that we support are 64-bit applications, and so she's got uh, probably a slightly faster installation than the rest of you just by virtue of the fact that she's on Mac. And the rest are running a 32-bit training bundle. Okay, so mine finished up. Are you all still running? You're done? You see a, a thumbs up, you're nodding your heads, good. Glad to see that. There's two outputs that come from principal component analysis. And as an aside, you should have this little icon that looks like a white house on a blue background. Whenever you click that, it should bring the project navigator to the front. So we can see clearly here that um, we've got these two outputs that were created from principal components analysis. And just like with anything else, we see this detailed log note that specifies exactly which parameters we used when we ran it. The outputs here, the second one that actually showed up on the front, is pretty simple. It's just telling the eigenvalues associated with each of those five components. I won't get into the, all of the mathematical jargon here if you're not familiar with eigenvalues. You can just think of it as kind of how much of the variation in the population is explained uh, relatively by each of those five components that we calculated. But then this other spreadsheet that it created, it's just called Principal Components Additive Model, it has the actual vectors for those five components where we can see the scores for each individual sample all the way up and down. What we want to do with this is merge it onto the last spreadsheet that was in the bundle that we haven't looked at yet and make some plots where we can actually see the stratification in action. So if we come to the File menu and Join or Merge Spreadsheets, you should have this second one in the list that's just called Population. That's a pre-cooked spreadsheet that we made that if you just join it using all of the default options, so under Current Spreadsheet, you should then get this column added on where we have four categories. Samples are all either in the study population, they're in the Yoruba African population,
population, the Chinese, Japanese, Asian population, or the Seth Utah representing Northern European ancestry. So this will be our first time creating a scatter plot. And the easiest way to do it is just click this little button right up here that looks like a scatter plot. We see these blue dots on the background of the axis. You can also get to it from the plot menu. But I'll use the shortcut button this time. And we see a dialog like this, where on the left we select the variable to plot on the x-axis, on the right for the y-axis. We could select multiple y-axis variables. As it is, we'll just get the second one. We only allow for one variable to be plotted on x, and I won't get into the technical aspects of that, but that's just the way it is. And let's go ahead and just run this. So we've got this first eigenvalue that should be around 26. If you've been following with me, the second one should be around 18. And we get this plot. Now, <clears throat> um, if we want to figure out more about what's going on here, what I'd like to do is recolor the points based on that population variable that we merged on. And just like before with the histogram, if I want to recolor individual plot points, I need to click on the actual plotted variable. And notice it's labeled according to the second component name, so that's the one that was plotted on Y. That's because the x-axis is fixed. It assumes that you're plotting this one on Y against the one on X, and so everything you do with it is going to be labeled according to that Y-axis variable. So when you click on it, you get the option to color, just like before. We'll color by variable. And we have to pick from the list which variable we want. We'll use the population variable and click OK. So now we can look at this and see more readily what's going on. Uh, blue, which is kind of hidden back here, is our half map European reference group. Green is our half map Asian reference group. Gray is our half map African group. And so what we're seeing in orange, the study subjects, they're mostly grouping together with European, while all of these along this axis are most likely to be African Americans. They usually fall along a continuum between European and African. Uh, we have Asians up here. Right in this area, honestly, that's where we typically tend to see Hispanic or actually um, Native American, Latino, admixed Hispanics. That's probably what we're getting here, although if we looked at additional components and went a little deeper into it, we might get a better picture of that. Or if we had uh, the PatMap Phase 3 data with more reference populations, we could be more certain of it. Now, uh, when you click on points in a scatter plot, go ahead and just click around and pick out a few of these. You see that it will always give you the subject ID for the particular sample you're looking at. And you do have these links that will take you back to the source data, highlight the exact cell. So if we had a larger phenotype spreadsheet here with more depth to it and you saw an outlier sample and wanted to check out whatever else you knew about that sample, you could just click that link, come back here, and find out more. Any questions about principal components and how we've um, calculated and displayed these? No? Okay. Then let's go ahead and move on and go over to part six, SNP quality assurance. And at this point we're going to back up a little bit to the original raw data and follow a slightly different workflow. And just for the record, we have been going for about an hour now on this tutorial. Probably what we'll do is finish up part six and part seven, which is the basic association testing. And then we'll take a short break and move on to some of the sequencing stuff in the other project. Okay. So part six, SNP quality assurance. Before we get into this, let's kind of clean up the desktop, close any of these spreadsheets we've been creating, and come back to our spreadsheet called Edited Phenotype that we made at the very beginning. 
and then also open up our training data and oh good we already have one at least I do that already has everything activated and that's because I ran statistics by sample on it if you don't have this first original spreadsheet with all rows and columns active the way you can reactivate everything is either to use a control A keyboard shortcut or in the select menu activate all we'll just turn everything on whoops not the right button select activate all and you're ready to go with it so um, let's come back to the edited phenotypes where I was starting to go a minute ago and we're going to join phenotype together with genotype so file join or merge spreadsheets this should be getting pretty familiar by now I'm going to merge it with that one we just made by activating all the rows and columns or even take the first one in the list it doesn't really matter for now which one you select we're going to merge this all back together click OK and we're going to get a new spreadsheet with phenotypes and genotypes together now at this point we're going to select a set of SNPs to use for association testing when we're doing association tests we're going to use a slightly different set of filtering criteria than if we were setting up the data to run principal components like we did a few minutes ago. So um, first thing we'll do is set a dependent variable. If you click with your regular left mouse button directly on the variable name here, the column should turn all pink or magenta technically. And that indicates that it will be used as the dependent variable. So we're going to test for this phenotype 1. If you didn't follow along with that edit earlier, that's fine. You can just use phenotype 3 or one of the others. Now, once that is set, the next thing we're going to do is turn off the X chromosome again. We're going to use the, the regular association testing that doesn't adjust for X today. So. I just use the shortcut button here above column one that looks like white and green columns. That's the activate by chromosome dialog. So I'm turning off X. And now we're ready to apply some basic filtering. And the options that it is asking us to use here are in quality assurance under genotype filtering by marker so it's the same one we saw before with the little funnel icon we'll keep it about the same so call rate of 95 percent minor allele frequency this time we're actually going to be a little more inclusive and include some rare variants in there go down to one percent then on Hardy Weinberg the big difference here is this variable perform filtering based on this was not active last time because we didn't have a dependent variable set. But since we do have this case control variable set, we can choose to only use cases or only use controls for calculating Hardy-Weinberg. We'll go ahead and use controls only. Then keep everything else like it is and click Run. So I'll move this so you can see all of my options. Now, the reason for using only controls in Hardy-Weinberg filtering is because, quite frankly, if there is a causative allele out there that is driving the phenotype, we would expect that SNP to be unbalanced in the cases. And, you know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but the reason Hardy-Weinberg filters became common in GWAS was mostly because of chips that were biased towards calling one allele over another but if you focus in on the controls you can figure out which ones are um, balanced and calling appropriately of course if you have a stratified sample like what we've got here with some representation from different population groups Hardy-Weinberg filters probably going to recognize some SNPs that are um, differently distributed in various populations we're just going to ignore the fact that we've got those Asians and African Americans in here for now and just run with it 
So just like before, we get our filtering results output. And also we see there are 312,000 columns that remain active now after doing the filtering a little bit differently. We get more data left to work with. And I'm just going to subset this one last time and call it filtered SNPs for analysis. And I think we're ready to go. Um, is everybody keeping up? We got ready for a break? We're almost there. So let's move over now to part seven. Um, genotype association test analysis for a binary trait. You should already have now, after running that last filter, a spreadsheet where phenotype one is set for the dependent variable, and we have about 300,000 columns of data to analyze. We come to the genotype association tests button. You can get this shortcut here, or also in the analysis menu. Notice it's the same icon with that AT with a little double helix running through it. Here we can select the model we want to use and the test statistic we want to use and get some other options for output formatting. And um, we did an additive model on the same data earlier today, so maybe we can do something different this time just to be clever about it. Although, frankly, additive runs fastest, so we'll probably just take that one for now anyway. Um, on the additive model, the options for testing, there's a simple correlation trend test, Cochrane-Armitage test, an exact Cochrane-Armitage test, odds ratios. We'll keep it exactly like we're set up already, so Cochrane-Armitage, calculate odds ratios with that. Notice up here at the top, there is an option of whether we're classifying alleles by frequency or by reference alternate. That's something that comes into play if you have data generated from sequencing. By default, this frequency is testing a p-value based on the minor allele as calculated empirically within your data. While if you switch it to this option, then it's looking at reference versus alternate, and it's basing the p-value on the alternate allele or the non-reference allele being associated with the phenotype. So it's just a slightly different paradigm, really. The results, the p-values will be identical. It's just a matter of how the effect direction appears in the odds ratios and such might be different if you switch it to classifying by ref alt. Also, this overall marker statistics tab, if you click on that, this is where you can select to have additional output together with your p-values. So if you want to see minor allele frequency breakdowns by case control side by side with your p-value, this is where you get that. Um, you can also count the alleles, count the genotypes, any number of different things you want to get here. And you want to make sure, the one thing I'll ask you to check is that this output data for PPQQ plots is checked. And go ahead and click run. All right. So how's it going? Is it finishing up or taking its time? All right. Um, I'll just go ahead and push forward here. If we look at this spreadsheet, we should see, if you check that box for PPQQ plots, you should see that you have both a p-value and a negative log 10 transform of the p-value, and expected values for both of those. Then further over, all of the other related outputs, we see a Bonferroni corrected p-value. might be interesting to sort on that and see, yes, we do have some that are significant after Bonferroni correction, and so on across, we see all of the additional statistics. If you want to create a QQ plot, 
what you need to do is, just like before when we did the PCA plots, come into this scatter plot menu, and on the x-axis, typically you would choose an expected value. You can either use the expected log 10p, which gets used a lot, or the expected chi-square, as long as whatever you put on y is the corresponding observed value. So if you get the expected log 10p versus the observed log 10p, and plot that, it should come up like so, where you can see the expected versus observed. And to add that diagonal line, that gives you the visual reference of the expected value. From, by clicking on graph one, again, that's where we get controls related to how this box in the graph window is displayed. That's where we can add an item, and the first choice in that list is to add a line where we can you know, specify the formula for the line drawing. By default, it draws in a line with slope one, y-intercept zero, so it's just showing us this perfect um, y equals x line. Any questions on this? Pretty straightforward. Should all make sense. One thing we didn't look at earlier, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Um, where did that go? Is that if you ever want to export one of these plots, see up here at the top left, there's this little camera icon and the little PDF icon. You can export as PDF. There's a lot of options controlling the size and shape of the output. Similarly, with the little camera icon, you can save it out as JPEG, PNG, bitmap, a uh, number of other formats. I think GIF and TIFF are formatted, or sorry, supported there. But if we come back now to our main association test results, if we want to plot this in the browser, we can right click right on this negative log 10 p value. And you should see an option down here to plot variable in genome browser. We select that option, pops everything up in the browser. I'm curious with yours, um, when you get to this point, do you see any annotation tracks drawn in? I'm not sure why mine aren't being drawn, but I, I think that something changed in this latest version where if you're working in NCBI 36, it doesn't necessarily show the default tracks like it used to. I'll have to talk to tech support about that one. Now, if you want to add any annotations to a browser plot, you can click directly on this annotation section. And if you're online right now, you should see a list of network tracks that you can select to draw in. It will read data off the internet to draw those tracks in. Now, you should also be able to click on this add local track, and your data bundle will have a handful of tracks available there. It won't have everything that we see in this list, but it should have at least a um, GWAS catalog and maybe a gene track and a few things. If you add those, they'll be drawn in. And lastly, let's just talk a bit about navigating in the browser. We've seen before in other plots that you can click and drag on the axis highlight a region and zoom to it. But then also, when you double click on features in the browser, it will zoom to the width of that feature. So for example, if I double click on chromosome 18, it will zoom to chromosome 18. That's just up here in this top uh, domain view. If we zoom in a little bit and I see, oh, there's an interesting gene. I can double click the gene and it zooms to the width of that gene. Now also, all of the annotation tracks, um, when you click on them, you should see some information over here related to that track. In this case, since I have this RefSeq genes with summary, it's giving me a little bit of basic mapping information about the gene and whatever summary information came from RefSeq. And also, all gene tracks will have these automatic links to external databases. And so if I want to look at the gene card for this DCC gene. I don't even know what it is. I kind of picked it by random. Deleted in colorectal carcinoma. So <clears throat> looks like we hit on an interesting cancer gene here. 
Yes. Um, also, the ability, if I'm looking at this particular genomic region, up here by the search bar, I can also look for that same region in some external browsers. So if I want to jump out to, um, in this case, I selected UCSC, it should show me that same genome build, the same width. So if you have your favorite tracks all set up and know what you want to look at in UCSC and see the same region, you can see it jumped right in on that same DCC gene. And I've got everything I need ready to go. Any questions? Everyone's following right along? Keeping up? Okay. So I think we'll go ahead and call that good for the GWAS tutorial at this point. If you push through with it and maybe work with it a little more on your own, you'll see that it talks about how to do regression analysis using the older version of regression in the software, which is more powerful in a lot of ways than the newer mixed model regression that we looked at this morning. It does allow a little bit more control on setting up models and doing advanced things. Um, I encourage you to take a look at that if you have time and if you're interested in that kind of numeric analysis. Uh, I think we're at the point now where I'm ready to set this aside and move to the other tutorial that's more about sequence analysis, but I think we might need to take a little break. Everyone agree? So let's go ahead and take maybe 10 minutes. It's 3 o'clock right now. Um, get going again at about 3.10. Does that sound good? Okay. And when we start up again at 3.10, we'll go through this other document and take a closer look at what we can do with sequence data.